and a bridgeway can be the fastest man from London to this spot by the Arc de Triomphe. The time he has got to beat is the 24-year-old record of 40 minutes and 44 seconds. much. I've got a real corker for you this week. Uh, we have the great Paris air race. Uh, I was in Paris this morning, as you just saw. It took me three hours and one minute to get back. I went to the wrong terminal at the airport and got completely <laughs> lost. Hope that doesn't befall our three teams today. Uh, hopefully we'll have a new record live on the programme sometime in the next 45-50 minutes. It is, of course, just after 7.16 in Paris. They won our uh, well, they've started the day a little bit before us. Another reason why I'm tired. Also, I'm very pleased to say that we should be going to America to bring you up to date with what's happening in the uh, seventh and crucial round of the America's Cup. So this week's programme is all about racing. Uh, the London Paris, Paris London, some 214 miles. That is the journey distance. Two teams going from here to Paris, one on the way back from the equivalent of the television centre in Paris back to us here in London. Hopefully a man called David Boyce will explode through the door over there before we go off the air. Oh, brought the whole family with him. Some pretty impressive hardware lined up. Outside at this moment, a helicopter burning and turning. The Air Hansen Sikorsky S76 in the park at the back of the television centre in London. And there in the middle, even the Director General couldn't park his car today, there we have an army lynx waiting to whisk Leo Sayer away. Another very important piece of hardware is down at Biggin Hill, Cliff Mitchellmore. At the end of the runway at Biggin Hill here, I can tell you, where well, the Spitfires and Hurricanes once took off during the Battle of Britain, we've got two jets just waiting to scramble. The two jets are first of all the Folan Nat, which comes from the Red Arrows, Red Arrow Formation Team, and by its side an executive jet, the full concern being flown by Nicky Lauda, who's just dashed up from the European Grand Prix of Brands Hatch. Here's Nicky Lauda. And then... Leo, don't worry, I will get it the safest possible way to Le Bourget. I will fly as quick as I can. Please make sure you come and go quickly so we can, we can beat the record. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nicky. And then over at Le Bourget, we've got an absolutely amazing machine, one of the very few privately owned Hunter jets. There it is. Michael Carlton owns and drives that amazing machine, and it is going to be powering its way back over here. At the uh, equivalent of our Battersea heliport, EC in Paris, there is a gazelle helicopter, one of two machines that we have standing by. I think also we've got a squirrel there as well. That's an Eiffel Tower, not a helicopter. Even I can recognise that. Sandra, I hello! I know. Is it cool? Is hearing me okay? Yes, and Good. I've got the new pullover on. I'm wearing the oh, new pullover. it's pull beautiful. <laughs> I have with me tonight Norris McWhorter from the Guinness Book of Records and in his own personalised lunar module, David Boyce, who's going to, ha we hope, have a record. And also Tim Ridgway, who made an attempt this morning. Tim, what went wrong? Well, unfortunately, we were flying so fast and so low, we had skin friction problems, which affected our transmissions with Le Bourget. Ah, you can work that one out at home. Also, we have Stephen Marsh, this week's Whirly Wheeler. Now, Noel, let's get this show in the air. Over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Sandra Dickinson, I'd like to have skin friction problems with her as well. <laughs> Lovely lady. We'll be uh, finding out what the Whirly Wheeler's got to do in a moment. But here are the two contestants who are shortly leaving for Paris. Ladies and gentlemen from Heaven 17, Glenn Gregory and Leo Sayer. <laughs> Glenn's got a problem that with that bone dome on, he can't hear anything. Yes, 20 past six, it's, no. It's no, it's no. <laughs> Hello. Are you confident, gentlemen? Yes, very. Right. Yeah. You're starting a little bit later so that the two helicopters don't bump into each other. Come on over here, Lee. I'm going straight away. Oh, yes. dear, dear, dear. We have squadron leader Suzanne Dando here. Yeah. Everything all right? Yes, and don't laugh at my shoes. Look at these! <laughs> <laughs> David Boy from the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> David is going to be checking that we do everything perfectly all right. Are you okay? Are you ready to go? Absolutely. Jolly good. Are they ready in Paris? Everybody in Paris ready for the countdown? Ready. 
Ready, jolly good. Stand by. Five, four, three, two, one, go! <laughs> They are couriers who work for the French television service. The front runner there has got a siren. They're not supposed to have one, but they seem to enjoy doing that kind of thing in Paris. And away goes David Boyce. Remember, he is going looking for that gazelle down at EC Heliport. And out in the car park. Has he got there yet? No. He's got the most tiring start, certainly. Leo Sayer has got himself a most exhausting start to the whole thing. That is a Lynx helicopter, Major Alan Wilde, Sergeant Major Ken Jackson, both instructors of the Army Air Corps in Andover. They are flying him. That machine is capable of doing 156 knots. Normally it's a tank buster. It carries eight missiles, and I hope they're not going to use the missile on the Sikorsky, which will be taking Glenn in a moment. It's about seven, eight minutes, they think, to Biggin Hill. Biggin Hill is about 17, 18 miles to the southeast of London. David Boyce, of course, on his way to EC. What time do we have? 1.18. 1.18. Shall we run on the 1.30? Ready to go on the 1.30. Start the bike. Tell me we've got five seconds to go. Five, four, three, two, one, go! <laughs> there goes Glenn Gregory. Eddie Kidd riding him. Down the ring road here. And out into the park. This is a particularly attractive park at the rear of the television centre and they've got a nasty little jump that they have to go over. The old age pensioners normally feed the goldfish by this bridge. There is the Sikorsky Colin Bates, Kevin Mulhern of Air Hansen are piloting that machine. If you want one, they're a million and a half pounds. It goes six knots slower than the Lynx. But on such a short trip, we are pretty confident that the time of one and a half minutes will be maintained. In other words, Leo Sayer is now well on his way to Biggin Hill in the Lynx. And there goes Sikorsky, theoretically 90 seconds behind. Will the speed differential make a lot of difference? One of the key elements to look for at Biggin Hill is whether or not Glenn Gregory... EC! This is EC! This is David Boyce arriving at the heliport. He is ahead of our estimated schedule. Here he goes, into the gazelle. While he gets in, I can tell you that big and hill, the big problem for Glenn Greg Gregory, who is six foot four, is how is he going to get into that tiny jet fighter? In the meantime, from Paris, on his way here to greet me, is David Boyce in the gazelle. He will have to fly up to the north to Le Bourget. They have slightly different rules about helicopter flying in France. Uh, they don't like going in straight lines, basically. So, so he could have a bit of a problem getting himself to Le Bourget. Don't forget, there is a hunter jet waiting for him to power him all the way back to Biggin Hill. Everything all right, squadron leader? Just about. Jolly good. <laughs> Your stockings are crooked. <laughs> say that. It's not only that that's crooked, <laughs> but never mind. They got away safely. Yes, so you're, you're already to do the plotting here. Well, I'm yes. out of breath already. We've got another 45 minutes of this. Absolutely well, exhausted. Can we no. go to America? Why not? Can we go to America? No, we can't go to <laughs> America at this moment. We're going to keep you posted. We can go to the America's Cup. They are covering it live on American television at And the other one, a Nat, formerly of the Red Arrows aerobatic team, will power them down to Le Bourget, which is to the north of Paris, as you can see. From there, it's a helicopter ride to Issy. It's then the incredible French motorcyclists that will take them to the equivalent of the television centre in London. David Boyce is making the return trip this way, and uh, the clock, as you will be able to see, is ticking away from this very moment. 40 minutes and 44 seconds is what we're looking for. The Guinness Book of Records have told us that they will certainly ratify, they will agree, that it is a brand new record if someone can get under that time. We're fairly confident we ought to be able to do that. Anything happening at Biggin Hill at the moment? Is anybody in sight? Six to seven minutes we thought the Lynx might be able to do it. Major Wiles assured me that although it technically does 156 knots, 
he would have the lever up round his ear and he'd probably be pouring along at anything up to 170. To begin now, Cliff Mitchellmore. You won't believe it now, but we've got mist around here and we're trying to get it, trying to see it in the distance. We think we just about got it in sight in the distance, but it really is having to come out of the, the mist. It's a very warm evening, uh, which will be very good for the jets because they'll be able to squirt along, uh, but it's very bad for our vis visibility and they've changed the runway around on one occasion. Uh, we've got a great army of people looking out. Down at the other end, as you know, the aircraft are actually uh, waiting and they're standing on the, uh, on the runway, lights flashing away. We've got the, uh, the jet, Nicky Lauder is the pilot down there and uh, he's, he'll be doing some uh, 566 miles an hour and we've actually got the helicopter in sight now at Biggin Hill. If we look around the, the corner, I don't know, I've got a camera here, but I, I don't know if you can see him. He, he's coming in. He's dropping down. We've got the lights flashing. I reckon within about 35 seconds, it's coming in now to Biggin Hill. Not only does this air, airfield have a great past, but it's also got a great future, as you will see, because now it's a very thrusting commercial airfield, a far cry from those Battle of Britain days. And it's just the thought that this, will, this aircraft will get to uh, Paris in about 22 minutes, and the very first a uh, commercial flight that flew in 1919 took two hours and 22 minutes. Here comes the Lynx now. The Lynx just dropping in by the side of Nicky Lauder's aircraft there. And I have to tell you that Leo Sayer is going to have one of the most comfortable rides because this is a very, very comfortable executive jet aircraft with seven leather arms. Cliff, Cliff, I'm sorry to interrupt you there. Let's go to Paris and here you see the Squirrel helicopter, which I'm not quite sure what that's doing. What exactly is that Squirrel helicopter doing? Who's in that? It's just parking. That is a helicopter parking. Back to Biggin Hill, and you, you can see Nicky Lauder is taxiing the jet. Back to you, Cliff. And they're actually on the way up the runway. The, the uh, changeover was very, very, very quick indeed. And here he goes. Lauder's coming up the runway now. And any moment at all, it'll be up and away. He'll turn away right and down towards the channel. He's off. He's unstuck. He's turning right. And he's away. And I reckon that he's actually ahead of schedule now. Well, what about that? That really was quite something. And now we're watching for the other helicopter. Would you believe the other helicopter is Cliff, right I will it? interrupt you again because that is... Uh... <laughs> At, at Le Bourget, here we have the Gazelle with David Boyce on board, and this is the sprint for the Hunter. There is this amazing machine, Michael Carlton owns two of these. He's got two aircraft, one called G-Boom, one called G-Hunt. The delay is while he's actually stripped, strapped in. And now we have Glenn Gregory arriving in the Hanson 76. Here he is, he's right down the runway now, he's just about to drop in, but he does have a bit of a problem, as you were saying, Noel, because he is a, he's a big chap, is Glenn, and they take a bit of getting into to these little nuts. Uh, he'll pop out there any second at all now, here he goes, and let's just see how long it really does take him. When he gets in there, of course, he has to do what Leo Sayer didn't have to do. Uh, Leo Sayer just sat in, a, in an armchair. He actually has to get strapped into the ejector seat, so that might take him a bit of doing. He's gently under folding himself. Cliff, we and go back to Le Bourget because the hunter is strapping in as well. All this is happening, ladies and gentlemen, ahead of our estimates, which is why we now have two people both being strapped into military aircraft. And remember, Leo Sayer is already on his way. At Biggin Hill, how's six foot, three, four, eight, seven foot? Well, Glenn he's... Gregory getting in. He's... They're still putting him in. Is get... the hunter going to roll? They sit side by side in the Hunter, it's tandem fashion in the Nats. Air traffic control at the Bourget are really working hard because they, they do admit they were a bit liable for the delay this morning that uh, spoilt the record attempt. There goes the Hunter. Flight time, Michael Carlton thinks, of about 18 minutes to Biggin. Michael Carlton and David Boyce taking off in the Hawker Hunter. It's got a top speed of 900 miles an hour, but when it's operating at about 2,000 feet above sea level, it can't do more than about 600 without breaking windows on both sides of the channel, of course. There he goes. If you've just joined us late, if you've just come in from watching the football or whatever, this is happening live on BBC One, an attempt on the London-Paris, Paris-London air race record. 40 minutes, 44 seconds. There's the Hunter going away, on its way here to the television centre in London. A Biggin Hill, how's the job of getting Glenn Gregory in going? Well, down at Biggin Hill, it's very difficult for me to talk to you because we've got the links right about uh, 
25, 30 yards away, but they're having terrible trouble getting Glenn Gregory in there. They, they already have one guy strapping him in. Now it looks as though they've actually done it. They really are having a terrible struggle. It is quite a small cockpit, anyone that's trying to get into one of these sliding cockpits. And that ejector seat really does take some getting into, particularly with a tall chair. They're having the most frightful problems. They thought they might do it in about 45 seconds. They're trying to get that at the hood down now. But this is a long time. This is really taking them a long time in that man. And they'll have to open the tap. Here they go. Get off it. And then that's the way. A bit late. But it's got a very good top speed, of course. It's got a top speed of some 900 miles an hour. But it does have sea level limiting speed of only some 550 knots. Thank you, Cliff. A recap of the situation we've got at the moment. Leo Sayer is well on his way. He's, we've just heard third champagne glass gone down. Well, I thought I noticed the crate going on the airplane, actually. Incidentally, his baggage has just arrived in Frankfurt. Uh, we've got the Nat away after Glenn Gregory's remarkably short pit stop for a man who's very keen on uh, Grand Prix racing. And then, of course, coming the other he's way, David ahead. Boyce. And he knocked his wing off as well, but uh, still going. <laughs> You've broken it. No, I haven't. Silly squadron leader. <laughs> Well, that's the situation. Uh, obviously, we can't cover exactly what's going on as they cross the channel. We will keep you posted. We hope to have a radio link with Leo Sayre in just a moment, find out if he's enjoying the trip. But this morning, a team from the Stuart Wrightson Air Brokerage Company had a go at that record, which we are now having a stab at. They went Marble Arch to the Arc de Triomphe, and Tim Ridgway did it. Let's have a look at the attempt this morning. <laughs> How do we feel at this moment with about a couple of minutes to go? Um, slightly relaxed but slightly tense at the same time. You got your passport? Uh, yes sir, I have. I don't want to mention it. It's in here, <laughs> complete with photocopy. Now you're no newcomer to this kind of race, are you? Uh, no, I was lucky because I was on the Navy Air Race team in the Daily Mail 69. The Transatlantic? The Transatlantic Post Office Tower to Empire State Building and reverse. This is going to be uh, rather a shorter trip. Uh, yes, I hope so. <laughs> Under 40 minutes, it's, it's a tough time to beat. The start at Marble Arch this morning, I was waiting at the Arc de Triomphe at this point. Eddie Kidd, who you've just seen take Glenn Gregory out of the studio, was there to take Tim. They go up the curb into the park here, Hyde Park, and once again, thanks very much indeed to all the authorities that have made this unique race possible. A dash for the Augusta 109, the fastest helicopter that we are actually using in this record attempt. Piloted by Captain Gary Savage. Up go the wheels. Tim plugs himself in so he can talk to Gary. That was what London looked like this morning at uh, just after six o'clock-ish. 109 touching down at Biggin Hill. The dash for the Hunter, the same dash that we've just seen David Boyce make. goes. Apologies to anybody in the Biggin Hill area that was woken up by this aircraft because Michael Carlson tells me he hardly bothered to gain altitude, he went straight down the valley. Now at this point they were hoping to have a very easy arrival at Le Bourget. It would normally be what's called a, a vectored radar arrival, in other words shortly out from Le Bourget you'd be told exactly which runway but they changed the runways and there was a breakdown in communications including an air traffic controller at Le Bourget who did not speak English so they arrived on the wrong runway our camera was in the wrong place but more importantly the helicopter was in the wrong place Tim had to run like mad to get to the helicopter it was possibly the point in the whole mission that cost the time here we are at EC, the Paris heliport with a gazelle landing a mad dash for an equally mad man. This motorcyclist is just out of this world. 
The gendarmes turned a blind eye in some areas. They went through red traffic lights. They even closed the busiest road in Paris. I was waiting at the Arc de Triomphe, and just look at the speed he comes up. <laughs> It was. It must have been very close. We were it, was in the it was incredibly close. It worked out at 42 and 32 seconds. So you just, it was just under two minutes outside the record. So what was the worst bit? Great show. Very great show. The latest update is that David Boyce is three minutes ahead of the schedule that we had. Leo is two minutes ahead of his uh, projected time, and Glenn Gregory, despite that very slow takeoff, is 40 seconds ahead of the schedule. <sighs> I could do with just a little bit of a rest now. <laughs> what is rather amazing about the lady that we are about to introduce to you is that she lives in Paris. We brought her all the way over here to sing. Ladies and gentlemen, Rose Lorenz. Our whirly wheeler of last week, Stephen Marsh, last week in the sense that he came up on the wheel, is in Paris with our lovely Sandra Nicholson. We're now at a very serious point in the show. We have Stephen Marsh here. Stephen, do you have any idea why you're dressed as a wasp? No, I haven't got a clue. But I'll tell you in just one minute. First, we're going to see what your wife has been doing, Pauline, on her first visit to Paris. What have you been up to, Pauline? I've been shopping. She's been shopping. And she has some bread and a sausage and she's expecting a lot of vampires for supper. Thank you, Pauline. Stephen, tonight we have with us a man who holds the world record for jumping in and out of a pair of Y fronts more times in one minute than anyone else, Mr. Didier Lecomte. And you are going to race Didier to try to break that record. Are you ready? Didier Lecomte, world record holder. Sandra, uh, um, uh, Sa Sandra, uh... You're thinking what I'm thinking. Uh, yes, yes, but you might have a different interpretation on it, but I think we're both thinking the same thing. Yes. Uh, Didier, avez-vous something else to put on? Oh, oh. Uh, He's not that Didier, actually, no. is he? No. Hello. Stephen, vos wifers? Didier, et vous prêt? Are you ready? Okay, here we go for a new world record. Three, two, one, go! <laughs> feet is 18 in one minute. You honestly wonder how somebody learns that they can do this, don't you? Because they have to be a Frenchman. Oh, is he going to do it? Yes. Oh. That is marvellous. A new world record has been established. He did it by one, with a few flaps, but he made 19. He got the new world record by one. Didier, congratulations. Stephen, how many did you get? Well, I lost count after two. <laughs> <laughs> Fair point. Well, that's jolly good, and I think you should go break a bottle of vin rouge with Pauline. Thank you very much, and over to you, Noah. <laughs> we do present some very exciting things, don't we? It's all very... <laughs> Very high tech. Right, a promenade to the wheel. We have ten names on here, of course. Let's find out who's going to be doing a stunt. Maybe as silly as that, actually. Let's give it a whirl. Coming down here, we've got the links uh, waiting, and I've got news that the, uh, that the hunter is doing very well. It, too, has crossed the channel. It's already 
on its way to the English coast at this moment. Leo Sayre is on the other side of the channel. He's just nipped over as well. So they've actually crossed over. And I have to tell you that the Lynx is also waiting here, waiting for that hunter to come over here. It's very misty, and I don't think that the uh, that the pilot's going to like it very much indeed, having to, to land here. But there we are. That's, that's what he's going to put up with. And we're straining our eyes, looking into that mist. We can't see him. We can't get in touch with him at the moment. As soon as we can, we'll call you now. Thank you very much, Cliff. Did he say something to me there? I just heard some bad news. Y you certainly have. We've got a storm over Boulogne. A storm so over Boulogne? We certainly have. So Leo's in for a bumpy ride. If it gets too bad, he's got to go all the way around it. Oh, I see. The relevance of that is that Boulogne yeah. is well, over to that here, side. <laughs> so, uh, yes, fine. OK, well, that's just a slight complication. Stick well, with it, squadron leader. I, I will. I'll keep Absolutely marvellous stuff. <laughs> America's Cup time. Uh, have they started the race in America? Are we able... Are we able to give Australians a little comfort? They, they haven't started the race yet. Let's have a look. Ah. Now, although I'm very keen on aviation, I know that's a boat. They are actually, at this moment, lining up for the start at Newport, Rhode Island. BBC One will be bringing you the very latest news on whether or not the Australians are going to manage to win for the very first time the America's Cup. Remember, the Americans have held on to it for 132 years. They've, they've got the cup bolted to the floor of the New York Yacht Club so nobody can nick it. You imagine, if anybody can, as Australians certainly can, good luck to the Aussies. I'm on their side on that one. Uh, in 1959, 24 years ago, a whole lot of people did what we are doing tonight. They attempted to get as quickly as possible between the two great cities of London and Paris. The gentleman who actually managed to get the record of 44, 40 minutes and 44 seconds is thankfully with us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, Air Vice Marshal Charles Morn. estimation why is it that it has lasted for now 24 years because no one's tried it up to now and I'm delighted to see that someone at long last has taken the opportunity to break it do you think people haven't tried it because it is so difficult to break no I think it requires uh, a fair amount of organization and as you said earlier on a lot of fairly expensive hardware mm. and uh, now the opportunity presents itself with uh, modern kit to break it, uh, I would have thought, comparatively easily, actually. Well, uh, as you saw this morning, <laughs> it couldn't be broken. Your record still stands. We're talking here now with you virtually into your 25th year as the holder of the record. Uh, they reckon it was Le Bourget that let them down. Would that make sense? Oh, I think so, yes. I think any uh, organisational snag of that sort, it, it cost you a couple of minutes, and as yeah. you said, uh, a couple of minutes, and he would have had the record. Right. There was something in common with what you did in 1959, what we are doing now, and that was uh, a hunter jet. And we've got the archive material here of your attempt, your successful and attempt in 59. Setting out to break the record set by Group Captain Ryder. helicopter to Hunter with every second counting, he beat the record in both directions. Squadron leader Morn's incredible time of 40 minutes, 44 seconds, remained unbeaten on the final day. The winner, less than a minute faster, squadron leader Charles Morn, formerly of the Fleet Air Arm, now RAF, received the 5,000 pounds, the trophy, and hearty congratulations from Lord Rothermere. To, let's immediately go to Biggin Hill because I think we can see a hunter in 1983. Cliff Mitchell was waiting for the arrival of David Boyce. We can't quite see it yet, but we're looking out at the mist. I have to tell you that I covered that 1959 air race. No, you, you will hardly believe that. Yes, you would. You'd believe it. We're told that we're, it's about a minute and a half away from landing here, and I'll try and get in touch with him because if, if I can try and get in touch with him, I, I can have a quick word with him. He, he's, just, he's just coming in now. Somebody's just seen him. Here he is. He's over the end of the runway. He's... It's right wing down, it's coming in, it, it'll be 130 knots, I actually, it'll be about 130 knots over the end of the runway, and watch out for the, for the parachute to come out, the braking parachute to come out, here he is, he won't be liking this landing very much because it has gone very, very, very grey indeed. But here comes the hunter and he's done well in terms of time, he's done very well indeed, he's touched down, and the Lynx is already on the hover, the chute is out. And 
now we're going to have the rendezvous between the Lynx and the Hunter. No point in talking to Mike Carlton now because all the belts will be coming off as he tries to get out and get into that Lynx helicopter. Major, Major Wiles know what, what this is all about because he too has been in uh, one of these transatlantic air races. There's the shoot and now the transfer. Up the side. He had those belts off long before he got there, I reckon. He's off. And he's doing well. Go! 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 There we are. The Lynx is off. And it's round now. Television centre and for you now. Well, 31. 31 means that he is now six minutes ahead of schedule. We must be on to establishing a new record with that. And we've also just heard Leo Sayer is one minute behind schedule. So that's a bit of a shame. He's sitting there drinking champagne and going quite, <laughs> quite mad. What is David Boyce probably thinking at this moment? Because in many ways, he can't do anything to speed it up, can he? No, that's perfectly true. He can't. But I think all he can do is to, you know, be quite sure that his organisation is right, which it clearly is. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's no doubt, flying straight into the television centre, uh, with a helicopter cuts out that breathtaking motorbike ride uh, going through London's traffic and that yes. should be worth you know a good six or seven minutes I would have thought to yes. him and clearly he's well on schedule to break it. Well your uh, Marble Arch uh, Arc de Triomphe record uh, is still going to stand quite clearly because the attempt didn't go well this morning. This is a new record we're establishing. In fact the distances are exactly the same aren't they? 214 miles. <laughs> yes it's just the the various odd stages which are slightly different you know the motorbike at either end yes. uh, the helicopters exactly the same in the middle but of course uh, the helicopters are going faster now than they did in my day which was a maximum speed of 90 knots and that's I, good I do think this is very fascinating that the idea that this record stands for so long uh, but we all dash around I mean many many more people have the chance to go flying package holidays and things like that and businessmen use uh, executive jets and whatever but we still can't actually get down roads very quickly uh, there's no, but no great leap forward, has there? Not really, no. I think the way that, that, that we did it was to um, make quite sure that on the opposite side of traffic lights, there was always another motorbike waiting. So if the traffic lights went against you, you ran across the road and jumped onto another motorbike. Yeah. Now, I don't think you can do that with many people uh, coming with British Airways, for example. The, the, the French described uh, the attitude of the gendarmes as faire le trouche, which actually means, like our, turn a blind eye, that they stick their head in the ground like an ostrich. Le Bourget, we have, we have, who's this? Is it Leo Sayer arriving at Le Bourget? Or has the Nat got past him? It's the Nat. No, that, that looks like a Nat. It doesn't look like a falcon. I'm being told in my ear that that is Leo Sayer in the falcon, but I am certain that that's a Nat, surely. Yes. So, Glenn Gregory, with the mad pilot, Stefan, has managed to get ahead. He's actually overtaken Nicky Lauder's private Falcon jet. He can feel nothing in there, Glenn, because his blood circulation packed up shortly after he was jammed in it. So Glenn has, in fact, picked up, and he's a minute and a half ahead of our computations. Leo is now four minutes behind our estimate, and don't forget that, in fact, Glenn has a minute and a half in hand because he left this studio a minute and a half after David Boyce left the television centre in Paris. To Le Bourget, let's see the Nat coming in. Stefan said that the aircraft capable of 900 miles an hour would probably go at about 600. Judging by his early arrival, if you do live down near the channel and your windows are now sitting on top of your television set, we apologise. And from America, as all this action happens, we learn that the America's Cup has been abandoned for today. They have put the boats away, they're going back, no doubt to the bar to discuss exactly what went wrong. So we don't find out whether or not the Americans have lost the America's Cup until presumably tomorrow. Glenn Gregory, he will be pulling off the oxygen connection from his mask, he'll be pulling off the radio link. Keep the helmet on, of course, because he's into a helicopter in a moment, and then a little bit later, he will be onto a motorcycle. You can bet that the belts are off. He can't wait for that canopy to open. This is... 
uh, London, the television centre, we are still awaiting to see the Lynx helicopter. And you can bet that those two instructors who have come up from Andover with their Lynx are really anxious to do the Air Vice Marshal's record an awful lot of damage. Uh, here's the Nats. The frustrating bit here is waiting to how quickly he can get up to the helicopter. I mean, obviously, we have to be as safe as possible. You can't go storming around what is a civil airfield. But the helicopter pilot is now waiting. Up goes the canopy. Leo, say, are we here is slipping back even more on our estimate? Maybe the storm which was moving towards Le Bourget from Boulogne has in fact affected the civil airliner a little bit more than the, the military jet. Delicate positioning at the moment. The gazelle wants to get in just as near as he possibly can. That was a quick one. That was very quick. And he's 36 minutes at that point. He's away to EC. Where the worst part for Glenn comes because he's got the bad motorcycles. Once again, if you have just tuned into the Late Late Breakfast Show and you think that little Noel's gone mad, we're making an attempt on the London Paris record of 40 minutes and 44 seconds. There goes the gazelle. That has got Glenn Gregory of Heaven 17 on board, Leo Sayer, although he was first out of Biggin Hill, is still yet to arrive at Le Bourget. Here at the centre, can we have a little look over the skyline of London and see whether or not that Lynx is arriving? It left Biggin by my little Mickey Mouse watch, I would have thought about four minutes ago, and you'd think we could nearly see it. What? Yeah. Yes, yes, we've got it. Here he comes. And the time, he's well on for a record. He has to be on for a record. It still could be very, very close, but it must be a record, surely. David Boyce has been into training for this and has lost two stones, so he claims, so that he can run this last bit. Suzanne Dando is outside waiting to usher him here into TC4. We don't want anything to go wrong at the last moment. The key thing to remember, of course, is a minute and a half has to be added to this time in terms of the race. Glenn Gregory has a minute and a half in hand. And Glenn is already on his way to the heliport in Paris. Here comes the Lynx. Leo Sayer is at Le Bourget. Le Bourget, Nicky Lauder at the controls. And the Falcon 10 jet that he operates along with a number of other aircraft. He's virtually the Austrian national airline. Boyce is in the car park. He's going to have to move very quickly. He's got... He's got two minutes to do it. It's all going to be in the run. If he is going to break this record, it is all going to be in the run. Come on, David. It is all on the run, whether or not he can beat it. Remember, we're looking for 40, 44. Leo Sayer touching down at Le Bourget. There he is at the Falcon 10. But as far as the record that the Guinness Book of Records are prepared to ratify. We're running desperately short of time. It's coming up to 39. It is an awfully long way round this ring road here at the television centre. It's a very big building. He is noticeably tiring. Come on, David. Come on, David! to EC. Squirrel helicopter chasing gazelle helicopter. In a moment we ought to be able to see Glenn Gregory arriving uh, at EC. How do you feel? Ah, exhilarating. <laughs> well done. Like well done. No. You beat the record. Well done. You stay here because of course as far as uh, the race for our trophy is concerned, Glenn Gregory has still got one and a half minutes in hand over you. Do you want to take your the helmet off? Way. Oh, he went the wrong way, did he? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> what have we got? Two helicopters Great. on their way to EC. Can we see EC, please? It is a beautiful heliport, surrounded by gardens, extensive lawns set out. It is the centre of Aerospatiale's operations in France. Aerospatiale is the uh, major French helicopter manufacturer. And we're waiting for a gazelle. And I do hope the man on the motorbike does not get as excited as he did this morning with Tim Ridgway because we could end up with all sorts of funny things happening on the Paris roads. Ben Gregory has still got a minute and a half in hand. 
but as you can see by the clock it is now getting desperately close that is the time from when Glenn Gregory left this studio I can see nothing on there worst moment worst moment when we passed the park and going in the opposite direction you fibber <laughs> You Absolutely true. You saw it? Right over the top of us. Really? Yes. Leo Sayer Some, waving? Somewhere over the channel. <laughs> that is amazing. What was the weather like? We heard there was a storm. Weather was a little bit, um, little bit murky. Yes. Visibility was a little bit tight. Right. But um, we had some real professional. Great. You're going to kill a huge gin and tonic, aren't you? You've got to believe it. <laughs> Let's have a look at EC. I've been so carried away with these times as the three teams have a go at this. I haven't the foggiest idea how much longer we've got on the air. Uh, hopefully, Glenn and Leo will both arrive with Sandra Dickinson before we have to actually go off the air. We've got three minutes to go. Terry is pacing up and down in the next studio, wanting to get on with this. Enough of this madness, he says. Why can't everybody go by Rolls Royce like I do? <laughs> no, we've got no sign of that. Surely that gazelle should have done it by now. Is the cameraman looking in the right direction? <laughs> I think we all landed. You, you really have done this in absolutely amazing form. Uh, we thought it would be an awful lot closer than this. We imagined that uh, Glenn Gregory could really be, well, with the benefit of the gnat. But uh, here it is, here it is, we got him. We thought Glenn might be pushing David very close indeed. Remember, he had a lot of trouble getting into the gnat, but uh, he managed to overtake Leo Sayer in the end, but he's now five minutes behind our computation. There's the gazelle coming into the EC, and he still has that bike ride. David, how long did the bike ride take? Two minutes. It took you two minutes, so we've got two minutes to add to the time the moment he gets on the motorbike. I'm told by Tim Ridgeway that's quite an amazing moment, that motorcycle. Unbelievable. <laughs> They're totally shut, mad, aren't they? Shut your eyes and you go. What's the incredible thing about the, uh, the Arc de Triomphe? Is I was told a story yesterday that they have such a bad traffic problem with accidents around the Arc de Triomphe, they invited the police chiefs of the world to study it for a day to see if they could sort out a better flow system. And they went away saying, no, just leave it the way it is. It's madness, but it's the safest way. There he goes on the motorbike. We reckon that's going to be about two minutes to I'm get really there. Big. What's the overall time? Is it, is it outside the time? It must be outside the time now. I think you're home and dry, David. It is. David Hoy of uh, the Guinness Book of Records tells me it is outside the time. Air Vice Marshal, would you like to come in? <laughs> Terrific stuff. You, you predicted, actually, that it would be broken, and uh, we managed to get around the problems as far as Le Bourget were concerned. Do you think anybody can do this any quicker? Yes, I do. You do? I made one or two little mistakes. Oh, such as one? Um, strapping in was a bit slow. But you're used to that sort of thing. Well, I've been practising. Yeah. But the, presumably the hunter went just about as fast the as Michael was could super. send it. Michael took it up 718 miles an hour. Oh, a little um, faster than he said it would. Oh, well, he was trying. Right. Let's go back to Sandra Dickinson and see. She must surely be able to see Glenn Gregory coming through now. Has Leo Sayer arrived the DC yet? That's the other part of uh, our team from this end. Obviously, going down to Paris is a lot more difficult than... Oh, good evening. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. We are going to obviously keep the studio live here so that we can see exactly what happens to Glenn Gregory and to Leo Sayer, just how long the journey takes. I'm dying to know whether Leo actually did consume all the champagne that Nicky put on board that jet. Um, you're going to have another go at this next year, aren't you? But of course. You're mad fool. You're but mad thing. Our thanks to Sandra Dickinson in Paris. Many thanks to Cliff Mitchell Moore at Biggin Hill. Ah, oh, there's Leo. Leo's on the bike as well. We leave you. Both on their way to Sandra Dickinson, they're both on the motorcycles. But we have, of course, a brand new record. Are we staying on the air a little later? This is good. This is good stuff. I like this. Glenn Gregory arriving with Sandra Dickinson with a bit of luck. Come on, let's have the picture. Remember, it's an hour later in Paris. And the wine is going to be flowing like aviation fuel. He's there! He's there! Gregory's there, Leo Sayer is on his way, 
The night belongs to David Boyce, who's established a new record for getting from Paris to London. Air Vice Marshal, thank you very much. Thank you to you for watching. We'll have another very different show at the same time next week. Bye-bye.